Hi, this is Linda Press Wolf. Welcome to LCTV Channel 20 and an interview with Lewis Burroughs' Thomas Panic. Tom is a person who's visually impaired, a guide dog user, and current president and CEO of Westchester-based Guiding Eyes for the Blind. He's also a marathon runner, having recently completed the Boston, New York City, and California International Marathons, to name just a few. Tom, what sparked your interest in running? Thank you, Linda. First, I was a runner as a high school student in cross country, and it was a sport that I could participate in uh, with great enjoyment at that time. And over time, as I lost my sight, I couldn't play ball sports anymore. And so running became an option when I figured out that I could continue to run as long as I had a sighted guide. Now, how about your first race? Tell us about that experience. My first race was when I was sighted and I prepared like anybody else would prepare. And I took a long hiatus from running when I lost my sight. And it was many years before I got back out there. And my very first race back was a 5K. And that race was interesting because I still had a little bit of sight left and I navigated the course, but along the course there was an obstacle that I didn't see which was uh, a divider between the lanes on the street, and I ran right into it. Oof. Um, much later in time, uh, after taking a few more, zero, uh, few more years off, I found out that there were individuals who are visually impaired and blind who used a sighted guide, a human sighted guide, to help guide them through the race course, and it was something I committed to doing. Now, how many marathons have you entered? I've entered four marathons in the past year, and I have completed all four, I'm happy to say. Great. And how about over a lifetime? Have you estimated o how many marathons? Over my lifetime, I believe I'm at nine right now, and I hope to make Boston Marathon 2015 my tenth. That's very admirable. I accomplished one, and that was enough for me for a lifetime. Most of us say at the 20-mile mark that we'll never want run one again, so I understand. <laughs> it wasn't so much the race itself, it was the training and, yes, and all the, the time it takes to prepare. It takes a great deal of time. It really does. So in, in talking about preparation, how do persons who are blind or visually impaired uh, prepare and train and run a marathon. Well, Linda, since you've run a marathon, you understand that you really have to have advanced planning and make sure that you get out there and put the miles in. Uh, so from that perspective, it's no different. You have a training schedule, you have a regiment, you have to work around family, job commitments, and other obligations. So squeezing the time in, as you know, can be a real challenge. But the other part of it is, not only are you working with your own schedule, you're also relying on other volunteers to help guide you through the race and also through the training experience. So in a way it's very positive because you motivate each other, and I'm sure when you were preparing for the marathon, you had friends that you went to run on uh, with in preparation for the race, and it's the same for me. The big difference in my case is that when I'm running with a group, one of the guides is tethered to me by the wrist. And that tether is the functional equivalent of a guide dog or a cane. It helps show me the direction to go in. And getting in tune with your guide runners is part of the training process and helping them understand how to communicate with you and also you adjusting to their particular running style and pace. Now, when you're uh, looking for uh, a sighted guide, uh, what are some of the things you consider? Well, first, uh, availability is important. Uh, people in the local Lewisboro area who step up to the plate and want to be a sighted guide, who are willing to get up early on a Saturday morning and, you know, the very cold weather that we have lately, uh, despite the snow or ice. Uh, so availability is important. Second, the distance that someone wants to run. Usually, if someone's preparing for a marathon, you're ramping up, as you know, the miles as you come closer to the race, and then you taper at the end. So the willingness to go out on a Saturday morning and run 10 to 18 miles uh, in any given weather is 
what I would say 90% of the feet. Uh, and then the other part of it is pace and uh, trying to find somebody with a relatively close pace to what your estimated finishing time is important. But the bottom line is anytime you can get out there and run with a guide, uh, those miles are more important than no miles. So finding willing volunteers who enjoy running uh, to go out with you is probably the biggest challenge. And how do you find a sighted guide? Sometimes via word of mouth. Um, sometimes there are clubs out there. There's, there are cl running clubs nearby, uh, both in Ridgefield. There are people that run on a regular basis in the Ward Pound Ridge Reservation and also in Katona. And I've done the Katona 5K and posted on Facebook and I found a running guide for that particular race. Mm -hmm. uh, so it really is a variety of uh, word of mouth as well as social media means. Uh, in New York City, for the New York City Marathon, I ran with a running club called Achilles, and they assist people with disabilities get through the race. Now, as a former New York City Marathoner myself, I know how exciting that journey is. So tell us about your journey to the 26.2 mile finish line at the New York City Marathon this yeah, past November. That was a very special moment. Uh, this year, the New York City Marathon was my main goal, and I ran Boston. Uh, a few months before, and at the 22nd mile in Boston, I didn't have any more to give, and I had to walk up uh, what they call Heartbreak Hill, and it is quite a steep hill, and I didn't feel as well prepared as I needed to be in that particular race, and so I really committed to stepping up the pace and doing a lot more hill work, and here in Lewisboro, we're fortunate to have a lot of hills. So you're either running up a hill or down a hill as you're running around the area. And I did a lot more hill work before New York City. And even though the five boroughs aren't the hilliest of terrain, you do have to go up many bridges. And the bridge span is an incline and a decline on the other side. So preparing for New York City and running a successful New York really took quite a bit of hill training. Um, the other part of preparing for it was I knew that it would be uh, cold, and I had the benefit of cold weather training, but it was extremely windy, and the wind we did not prepare for. There were wind gusts in excess of 40 miles an hour on the bridges, and it was like running uh, in the, through water uh, going across the bridges. So fortunately, I had done quite a lot of treadmill training, no wind on a treadmill, but you can really adjust the treadmill up to a 15 degree grade, and I trained in Cross River, uh, there at uh, Body Fit Gym quite a bit. I also got out there and uh, ran in the area. And I felt like by the time the race was there, though it was cold and it was an early start, I felt ready. My next question is going to be to ask you what the best and most challenging moments were in the New York City Marathon. I have a feeling you answered one of those, the challenging moment being the cold and the wind. Mm -hmm. How about the best moment? I think the best moment of the New York City Marathon, it's such a special marathon. You get to run through uh, all the different communities, as I mentioned, the five boroughs. Uh, but the most exciting moment of the marathon, really for me, was going down First Avenue. As you may remember, that's your first real downhill where you can pick up your speed and we're all elite athletes at that point because you have hundreds of thousands of spectators cheering you on through a corridor of sound for me and just hearing all those people cheer as you cruise down First Avenue knowing you still have a lot ahead of you because it's about uh, the halfway point but you still have already accomplished quite a bit to get to that very point and as you make that left turn and you run that full sprint downhill it just felt really great my team was fantastic I had a guide runner out front I had a guide runner tethered, and because the marathon had so many participants this year, I think it was the most runners that the New York City Marathon has ever had. I had to have a guide in the rear as well, all that were assisting me uh, and letting others know as well that I was visually impaired and that uh, other people needed to be aware, as did I, of the terrain as you shoot through First Avenue. So that was the most exhilarating part. Aside from the finish line, of course, <laughs> and that is getting to that 26.2-mile uh, mark and knowing that you just had a few more paces to go at the end as you get through Central Park and as you cross the finish line, knowing that you just accomplished the New York City Marathon. Very, very exciting race. Uh, the support of not only the local community, but the people coming out to watch the race in New York City. Very exhilarating, very cold, very windy. 
but very exciting. <laughs> well, you've just uh, aptly described uh, what's different about the New York City Marathon compared to maybe other races that yes. you've participated in. Um, anyone else in the Panic household who's following in Dad's footsteps and taking an interest in running? Well, interestingly enough, my wife Melissa was never a runner. And about four years ago, she began running. And as we speak, she's out running in Ward Pound Ridge. Uh, she's done a couple of 5Ks already, and she's hoping to get to a 10K. So she would be the first. Uh, my daughter uh, has picked up the physical fitness club at uh, her school at John Jay. And so she's starting to run a bit. And also, uh, sometimes locally in the community, I'll go and my boys, Timmy, TJ, and Troy, will help guide me. Now, TJ is only six years old, so he's a little bit too young to do that. <laughs> But uh, Troy is certainly stepping up to the plate. And I think that one of them would really like to guide me through a race one day. Tom, I'd like to turn to Guiding Eyes. Guiding Eyes for the Blind has a stellar reputation in its varied programs for persons who are blind, visually impaired, and deafblind. It sets them apart from other guide dog schools. I know Guiding Eyes is piloting another new program option for endurance athletes who are blind, a running guide training program. Tell us more and why this is important. Well, Linda, a guide dog has such a profound impact on a person's life when you have visual impairment uh, or if you are deafblind. It really is your key to independence and mobility, to confidence, and in many ways, being able to break down social barriers. And people who have a guide dog are more active, uh, more able to get back and forth to work. Uh, and all of those things resonate with me because of course I'm a guide dog user and I have Gus at my side uh, everywhere I go. So when I put together my love of running with the idea of all of these things that a guide dog brings together, the, the natural evolution of that thought is to have a running guide and that is to have a guide dog that can assist a person get out there and train for potentially even a race. But not just for those elite athletes or those people that want to run a marathon, for individuals who have vision loss who want to get out and just get in their community, perhaps pick up the pace a little bit uh, in an environment that's safe, uh, in an environment that has a limit of traffic. And in the right circumstances, a guide can assist a person run. And so this pilot program is something that as CEO of Guiding Eyes I'm very excited about. Uh, it took a little convincing because it's new and it's different uh, for us to explore it, but I think at this point in time it has a lot of excitement out there. I held a fo focus group during the California International Marathon of blind and visually impaired people who are still using a cane for mobility and also individuals who use a guide dog who are runners and each and every one of them unanimously told me that if they had an option for a running guide it would change their life and because Guiding Eyes is about changing the lives of people who are visually impaired this is a natural next step for us to explore. And we're meeting a demand. We Absolutely. are meeting a demand Linda. Absolutely we are. Well, back to Lewisboro. Sure. Uh, joining Guiding Eyes last year you had to move your family from Virginia what attracted you to the hamlet of South Salem in Lewisboro? Well, when we came up to look for a home, we drove around the area and we immediately fell in love with Lewisboro. It's one of the most beautiful places that I've ever been to. And it was a snowy day. And as we traveled the roads, which are sometimes treacherous, <laughs> we took our time and we crested a few hills here we saw the wonderful uh, statistics about the schools and how well the schools were regarded by the community and the different programs as well as uh, different events and activities that Lewisboro offers. And it really had everything that a family possibly could want uh, as a place to uh, have your children grow up as well as for adults. So uh, it was just a lovely, lovely place that really drew us in. And, you know, I'll, I'll have to say it's been such a pleasure. Uh, it's such a wonderful area to live in. The community is outstanding. Uh, the teachers are wonderful. And it's a place that we have decided to hang our hat.
Uh, and um, what have you enjoyed about the lifestyle here in Lewisboro? Well, not only uh, the restaurants, you know, going to Katona in the area, but I've also enjoyed the people. Uh, you know, wherever I go with Gus, uh, I'm warmly received. And people know about Guiding Eyes. It's such an important place of goodness because what we do with our mission is so critically important for not only the area, but we have people come from all over the nation, all over the world, in fact, to come to New York here to get a Guiding Eyes dog. And many people in the community have a release dog from Guiding Eyes. They help to home socialize puppies. Uh, we have friends in the area now, new friends that we're making. Uh, who have had puppies in their homes for the first time and others that have done it 30 times before. So part of the very, very special bond that I have with the community is that we do have Guiding Eyes Dog, uh, an interest in Guiding Eyes throughout the community because we have so many volunteers there. So for me personally, that's been very special is just to go to the local Shell station uh, and to run into individuals that I know or to go into a restaurant with Gus where people readily recognize that Gus is a Guiding Eyes dog. Well, I couldn't agree with you more about the treasures of Lewisboro or the importance of Guiding Eyes work and their mission. So thank you, Tom, for joining us. You're very welcome, Linda. Thanks for having me. Tom, thank you for sharing your story with us. And thank you for watching LCTV Channel 20. Watching Lewisboro Community Television, Channel 20.